Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We're here today, as is so frequently expressed in our meetings, thanks to the grace of God and AA. Most of us learn about the grace of God through experience with someone who has known of it and who is able to mediate it to us. The entire movement has come to know of the grace of God as it has been mediated to us, expressed to us in tangible form by our next, next speaker. I look forward to this opportunity of sharing the meeting because it would give me an opportunity to meet her. And I'm very happy that she has been able to come to the coast and be with us this afternoon so that you may feel and come to know the sweetness of her spirit, the depth of her concern, and the effectiveness of her service to suffering alcoholics. Sister Ignatius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and my good friends, in fact, I feel alcoholic phenomenon is part of my family, really. I um, know that God works in mysterious ways. How little I thought when I entered the convent that I had spent my days, at least as many of them as I have, in caring for alcoholics. But God works in mysterious ways, and certainly His divine providence has directed all this. I feel He can use very weak instruments to carry out His design. But uh, in our vast point, as I know, Colonel Town would say, we see many wonderful results. Nothing short of miracles. We are not uh, <clears throat> given to a lot of imaginary things, but certainly God is extremely kind to the alcoholic. Because the child tries to hold his heart, he'll never, never uh, refuse to help and give him a great thing. I feel that uh, it's a privilege to work in this field. I owe much to my community. I, when Bill called me about this, I certainly could hardly think of appearing on a program like this. And as I said, well, it's something like the AA third step. We turn our life and our will over to God on the direction of our superiors. My superiors might have sent word at any time that I was to take no more. It came nearly to that, nearly to that point in a few cases. But thank God and the fervent prayers of, well, I suppose many of the sisters who were interested and our beloved Dr. Bob and Bill himself. Somehow we were the two. I was just, uh, Bill asked me to say a few words about how we got started in Aspen. <clears throat> I hardly knew myself. I was sent there in 1928, just as a, well, it might be, the doctor recommended occupational therapy. Changed of occupation for a while. I was in the field of music, and as you know, that's rather nerve-wracking. Uh-huh. And, uh... <laughs> Uh, he did it for me. So, uh, I was sent uh, to St. Thomas, which was just opened in 1928. And it was there I met Dr. Bob. We had no open staff the first year because we didn't know the men, nor did they know us. Doctor operated at our hospital and the other hospital. <laughs> I didn't know they had a drinking problem, and in fact, I wouldn't have known it 
Had he not told me so? Because he didn't come to the hospital when he was drinking, evidently. Oh, I can recall uh, sometimes that his voice was rather reverberating. I could, <laughs> I could hear him when he came in the back door. He had a decided uh, accent, I mean, New England accent. But I, somehow I liked him because he was so, so straightforward. Those of us working on hospitals know that some doctors uh, make everything an emergency, a matter of life or death. I will tell you the exact truth about this case. Say, well, my patient is wait a few days, or if they can't, then you know that you take them for what they say. However, the doctor is so straightforward, so I enjoyed working with him. And one day he told, he looked rather uh, down. We often had those chats. And uh, this uh, morning he came, he looked rather down. I said, Doctor, what's the trouble this morning? Well, then he told me. He said, Well, sister, he said, I might as well tell you that um, uh, I came in contact with a New York broker and uh, we got had a thinking problem for a long time. And somehow we got together. And we've all tried to work out something that will help you. Drunk, he said. Well, <clears throat> he said we've uh, been trying it out. They tried a few rest homes. And uh, he had some in the other hospital. And he said, Sister, would you consider taking one? Well, I hesitated because... Sometime before, oh, probably some months before, I took a man in who always looked, um, I didn't, I didn't know much about this drinking. I used to jump the drink. <laughs> and some could drink and have it, well, others couldn't. So, uh, as they call me to the emergency, and I went down and talked with him. Oh, he just just like, just lie down a little while. He works at the city garage and looks like a very respectable person. Yeah, I've been drinking a little too much and I want to look separate me. Which I thought was a good thing. <laughs> well, the only bed that uh, we have at the time was a bed in the four bedroom. Then we knew nothing about uh, special treatment. And uh, I signed to the man on service, on medical service. And Registered him, put him to bed, and I said, You won't cause any trouble. Oh, no, he'd be an angel. <laughs> well, I forgot about him. When I came over early the next morning, the night supervisor, who was tall, sister, we all teach her about her big feet. Well, she was standing at the door waiting for me. He said, the next time you take a DT in this place, please stay up all night and run around after him as we have to. <laughs> mm. That wasn't the end of it either. I decided then that that's enough. I often felt sorry to see them turned away, but I was not the last word in the hospital. So when Doctor proposed my taking a real look, because I thought it real <laughs> Well, you can imagine my misgivings. I said, oh, dear me. I, I told him about this experience, and I said, doctor, I'm not only will I be put out, but I said, the patient and everything else. I said, I don't think they want alcoholics. He said, sister, this, this, this patient won't give you a bit of trouble, because I will, I will medicate him. I'll assure you. <laughs> Well, I had much confidence in him because he never said anything that wasn't so. Not all he said. Well, very carefully, I said, well, Doctor, I shall take him then. And put him in a two-bedroom. I thought I was doing pretty well because we were so crowded in those days. And uh, that's were rather printing. So I... Took him to this two bedroom. Doctor, 
pardon me, Johnson went up and meditated him and everything. And I thought, well, I figured I wouldn't hear much till the next morning anyway, if there was any trouble. So uh, there was a word about it. Doctor then came to get in the office. Thank you. He said, Sister, would you mind putting my patient in a private room? I thought I had done pretty good to put him in a two bed. <laughs> he said, You know, they had, he said, there'd be some men come to visit him, and they'd like to talk to him privately. Well, I uh, said, I'll do what I can, Doctor. After he left, I went up and looked the situation over. And right across the hall, we had a flower room where we used to prepare the patient's flowers. And I thought, well, they can fix their flowers somewhere else for the day, and I believe I could push the bed in there. <laughs> That's what we did. And his visitors came. We kept a close eye on them. <laughs> Respectable looking men, they don't know that they ever took a drink. <laughs> and, uh, went along. I thought, now the next time, I won't have this trouble and I'll put him in a private room. So the next one that came along, I put him in a private room. And, uh, he, uh, Dean, I didn't know much about these alcoholics. I was not an expert, surely, the Lord picked out a, a weakling when he picked out me, I know. But, um, however, I took him down to the room, as I would any patient, and then was taking the chart to the desk to explain to the nurse a little about it. I couldn't tell her too much, but said Dr. Bob would, uh, would give her the orders. And he wasn't down after him. <laughs> Well, he had a short time and everything else. <laughs> I nearly, I nearly went through the floor because the nurses all looked and everything. And I, you go by that, you will be right down. So the nurse came down with me, and here he was under the bed. <laughs> well, I thought this will never work. I don't think this will go at all. I better put two together the next time. I didn't want to give up at once. I don't know just exactly what I did, whether I had someone stay with them or what I did. But I know after that, I put, uh, put two together and then finally took a four-bedroom. That seemed to go pretty good. One would help the other. Usually, one or two would be in a few days. Before they'd be coming out of it pretty well. And then, um, so then we took another two bed across the hall. Well, it was hard to say no when they really wanted to do something about it. And, but that time the men were coming in quite often. So much so that some of the sisters said, Who oh, are these fine looking men that came in so often and seem so interested in the patients? And uh, I didn't say much at first, but I, later I said, well, that is AA. I said, what is AA? Would you like to know something about it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I'll bring somebody to it. I gradually got to But, of course, before that, a committee from Alcoholics Anonymous talked with Sister Superior, who's one who had a lot of experience in the old days of charity and all, and uh, she knew what we were doing. And she said uh, to these men, she said, well, uh, it's strange. She said, when you have them charity, they'd be running around the hall and they're in a lot of trouble. But since Dr. Bob is treating them, we don't know that they're in the house. So she said, there's no problem. If I bite you, see, just go right along. Well, that was wonderful. But that wasn't all. Of course, I'm late in patients, uh, complain because they didn't have visitors. 
At any time, if you say eight, uh, they seem like the privileged characters. <laughs> uh, so finally, they decided to, we had a small accident ward. It was sort of off in the rest of the um, hospital. And there we put in a coffee bar and Dr. Bob set up the podium. I uh, want to tell you that the first opportunity he had, he brought Bill over. And, uh, of course, I couldn't imagine who this wonderful Bill was. But I soon learned that uh, God had chosen two great men. But one didn't have the other supplement us. And together, it was perfect. I suggest the, I often say to our boys, had God just to have two great religious leaders, no one would have come near them. Because the alcoholic doesn't want anything about religion or God, nor do we try to teach religion to them. But they aren't in a very long until they're asking or telling them what experience they've had and what they'd like to do. They know they haven't been living right. And I feel that, as many of our nurses have said, the best sedative is peace of mind. If once they can be relieved of their anxieties and worries and treated properly, there should be no trouble. Personally, the first men and the doctor found set up the program. No televisions, no radios, no newspapers. Only literature pertaining to AA or something that would have a, a moral, I mean, a building of their morals and things of that kind. So they don't, they have all the reading they can take care of and then the visitors, too. Well, we went on with that. There's so many details I could bring in, but I don't want to make it too long because I know many of you have probably questions that maybe Colonel Towns could answer in front of people who know much more than I. But anyway, during doctor's time, I think we treated before between four and five thousand. And he treated them, he came in every day unless he was out of town or something like that. And uh, without any charge, he said, that's my time to see the AA. Part in those days, we didn't have too much either to suffer with. And you couldn't mention money very well. For how much does it cost? Because if we just get them sober, there's in a great deal. But that was taken care of later on. Thank God. It worked out very well. And there are no problems. Oh, many times, whether they have it or don't, we take them in because God certainly provides. And a man who gets his home is everlastingly grateful. Doctor. Uh, it's hard to understand. Sometimes you make rounds and they come down and say, Sister, let that man go home. He doesn't want this program. Oh, but Dr. there's a big family who has to set me up. Doesn't want the program. He isn't ready. So he was always right. Many times they frighten me almost because they have a heart attack or they would tell me they had a bad heart or something. And I hated to bother Dr. too much. Often I call in. I think members of this group or any alcoholic would often say a prayer for Ann. She seems to have phone with her. In her calm, quiet way, she's really an angel. I would call her and say, Oh, Ann, I'm so worried about this fellow. She knew most of them from either reputation or doctor telling about them. And uh, she would get the doctor if it was anything serious, but otherwise she said, now don't worry about them. Because, well, they have a, they have a, um, they're alibiologists, in other words. <laughs> and I learned they were. <laughs> they do anything to uh, promote another drink or treatment of some kind. So, well, uh, <laughs> We take them but once after doctor's plan to I thought, oh my, that's kind of strict, isn't it? But oh, I see the wisdom of it. 
Because if there is a merry-go-round, when that temptation comes, you're going to think, well, I can get back in there for five or six days. Well, that'd be all right. Sister could still take me back. And I'd only encourage my no drinking. They know that it's a one week that the sponsors and the uh, Colonel Town says they are. Their cooperation is tremendous. Any hospital who tries to just take them in on their own is very foolish because they need this sponsorship. I often say it's something like learning the technique of golf. You may know all the angles and all the rules, but unless you get out there in the field and do some footwork and practice, you won't be much of a golf. So if we try, Dr. Self, if they could be take, taken out of their environment, at first it was just five days because people were pretty depleted after the depression and all, and financially. And uh, the sooner we got them back to their families, the better. Although many of those first aid to take them into their own homes and try to help them back to the they worked in groups. It was marvelous what they did. But however, we uh, certainly have a, a firm that was very wise. Because the sponsor will not bring them until they are ready. And then we do screen them carefully and goes over. We want to be sure the sponsor is not just a person they met in a bar somewhere. <laughs> uh, but uh, one, I usually have some what groups are attending for now. I know most of them well, you know, who are the sponsors who are not. But it's a tremendous help. So finally, <clears throat> we, um, um, the time came. Well, as Anne, of course, died in 49. And that. It was very hard for doctors. She called from the Cleveland Airport. They had just gotten in from Texas. And the plane was down. It wasn't really. Mm -hmm. Phil knows more about this than I. Anyway, they brought her directly to the hospital. And we kept out of there, too. Because he was pretty well taken up with all this. And Anne died of pneumonia and all that. So, uh, went on from there, doctor. Then died in 1950, a year and a half later. He knew then, I believe, that he had a motivation. He had talked with Bill, well, I think that several times a week, if not every other day, he gave me a little message. And uh, I felt as though <clears throat> I knew Bill and his dad and too, because there wasn't very much done that they didn't consult together on it. Especially anything affecting the, the foundation of this. Then, uh, one day I got worried. We're just like people in the army, you know, we go to where we're sent. I often wondered whether I was off the mailing list or whether I was forgotten. <laughs> I, was, I was there for uh, 24 years. Probably one who started 24 years. And uh, finally, the obedience came. So I was to go to charity and uh, work with AA there. They had to have AA as charity and fine workers there, but they just had a small department. Now, Sister Victory, a very fine sister, who everybody loved, was there too. And she came down and we told her everything and Dr. Bob talked with her. And she really did a good job. But uh, they decided to build a new wing and all the extra. Oh, I know they talked to Alcoholics Anonymous was a thrill then or not, but the, everything was discontinued. It wasn't absolutely a case of life or death. So they <clears throat> just kind of forgot about AA. But Reverend Mother didn't. She so much. Good in it, I know. I went there in August, and I didn't hear a word about, other than on my obedience, it said uh, that I was to take care of this floor, and uh, 
certificate taken and worked at AA. Well, I knew someday maybe we'd have them. But anyway, I just observed and went along day by day. Finally, one day, I got a call of the surgery checking on the patient to see if I'm not the condition. They were worried worry about this patient, and Giselle rang to her explaining that the carrier wants to see down the floor. And I came down, and the architect of the new building was there, and um, a few nurses, you know, the director of our nursing service was there, and uh, of course the uh, carrier said, what kind of a setup would you like for this day? Well, you imagine standing in the middle of the floor and getting rather strange. I didn't want to pull myself or not. So, yeah. And I uh, couldn't think very fast. So this nurse uh, said, uh, well, sister, are they violent? I said, no, they're not violent. Oh, they're not intoxicated. Yes, they are intoxicated. <laughs> but they're clear enough to be skinny because we must make sure that they want the food. Well, she said to the architect, you won't need a table thing. <laughs> well, I said, I said, and as you're rocking, would you mind giving me a few days and we'll drop a little plan of what we'd like? Fine. Well, the day that they came was on the pizza, Lady Rosie, that's how we call it, Rosie Hall. And there is a uh, and that's a good that when I was moved there, I thought, oh, I'd love to have this in memory of Dr. Bob. Well, I thought I could search and rather than call it the alcoholic ward. We'll call it Rosie Hall. And I think you're marking that road, R8. Well, I thought all I needed was a and I had Dr. Smith, and I was good. Now, this will So we call it Rosie Hall for Larry. <laughs> Insignia on the door is RHS. So Miss Milton the one was granted by a hospital hospital authorities on October the seventh, nineteen fifty two. She's in Los Angeles, Rosie. I feel that the people, whether they're in the church or uh, whatever the denomination, we need to see a rosary and all means prayer. If you can get the rosary out, well, you think they're praying somehow. So to everyone. I think this is all a result of someone's prayer. The grace of God comes to someone's prayer and penance, that's for sure. Well, anyway, the, uh, the fair father named Rosary Hall, Solari. Well, I told you about that. The insignia eloquently expresses the efforts of the sisters of the Church of St. Augustine, a path of religious order as they join forces with the members of AA, a strictly non sectarian movement. In an attempt to rescue men and women of all creeds from the bottom of the of alcoholism, she admitted that this war must be sponsored by a number of AA and good standing, and must also evidence the desire not just to get sober, but also deserve and perpetuate your sobriety on a day by day basis. Unless you yourself are willing to admit that you are an alcoholic, you are advised to seek help otherwise elsewhere. The physical therapy is the most modern known for medical science. The patients in prior days of retirement from the outside world and the habits which have, have caused their collapse. There are no radio or television, um, newspapers or magazines. Nothing but AA literature and other literature in keeping with the programs are available. The patient may have no visitors except members of Alcoholics Anonymous who are welcome between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. The conversation turns alcoholism and its ravaging problems. Every evening, a member of AA comes to the hospital to conduct a brief AA meeting for the patients. In the fact, the front of our stands in the center of the hall where AA members and the patients often gather to discuss their common problems. A little oratory is open at all times, just if they want the retirement from the outside world and the habits which have, have caused this collapse. There are no radios, television, 
Supercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.